Right, so there has been a running joke that infinite immigrants is always a solution to everything. And I wish it were a joke, but it's actually Conservative Party policy at the moment. I mean, Kamli Drakpa, one of the best accounts on Twitter, makes these delightfully eye-poisonous infographics. Uh, this one just titled, and this was quite a few years ago now, Should we build massive tent cities in parks in our cities to house infinity immigrants? And they're just a typical YouTube normie thumbnail of big red arrows just saying where they should go. Wish that was just a piss take, but it turns out that's been the plan for quite some time, as we'll go back and see. Now, there are demographic and economic reasons that the government feels pressured to keep increasing immigration. I mean, just for a little roundup, I did an article on this a little while ago. We've had more immigration in the last 25 years than between the Norman Conquest and the Second World War. Part of the reason for that is that the Treasury Green Book says we need at least 200,000 people every single year to keep the economic growth afloat. That's GDP, not GDP per capita. It's why we're all getting poorer, but the graph seems to continually go up forever. And we've got sub-replacement birth rate. It's slipping below 1.5 now. So in order to pay the pensions and make sure that all the boomers are looked after in their old age homes, they think that they need all of those African care workers. One in three have told the WHO they abused their patients. And obviously, some woman died falling off a stairlift and person that was looking after didn't know the difference between bleed and breathe, but neither here nor there. That's apparently the, the government's plan. But it also turns out that there is a perverse incentive to import a clientele class over who seem to vote for one or the other party in perpetuity. And the Conservative Party are very aware of this, particularly Rishi Sunak, and he's been aware of this for quite some time. Now, the reason I'm talking about this isn't just because we all are frustrated by the endless amounts of migration, but it's because Recently, we had the whole kerfuffle with the Rwanda scam. Now, I call it a scam because we sent them 140 million and have pledged to send millions more and not a single person has been sent over there yet. And it turns out that we've got to pay for their bed and board for five years and Rwanda can send a bunch of their criminals here. And it's basically a refugee refugee exchange program because Rwanda can send one over for everyone we send to them. But don't worry, it's a deterrent, I'm sure. There was a vote on it about last week or so. And the MPs in the Commons voted 313 votes to 269, so a majority of 44, to pass the Safety of Rwanda bill, basically saying that despite the ECHR complaining, I know, they haven't listened it's to It's just a name for a British bill, the Safety of Rwanda, yeah, of course. I mean, they might need to reaffirm that given the radio in the 90s, but oh well. But we're there. Like, I, I just, I find it hilarious whenever we're just like, we're responsible for foreign country now. Yep. I mean, literally pick one out of a board. Belgian colony. Yeah, that's, a, that's our problem now. There you go. But anyway, point being, um, the bill passed despite 29 Tory rebels who, if they would have not abstained and rather voted against, the bill would have been shut down because obviously every single opposition member voted against the bill because it was going to at least pretend to promise to do something about the mass importing of fighting age men over the channel every single day. But oh well, uh, one funny little tidbit in here. So the climate minister why we have one of those, God knows. Graham Stewart, he did a 7,000 mile round trip from COP28 in Dubai to then vote, to then go back because the government were browning their trousers so much at having not enough votes to pass the legislation that they had to do that particular climate emissions faux pas. So a rebel source among the 29 voters said, the bill has been allowed to live another day, but without amendments, it will be killed next month. It's now up to the government to decide what it wants to do. According to the Telegraph, and this is in the mail, who, those who abstained in the vote did not gain permission from party managers, prompting concerns there would be enough Tory rebels in future debates to kill future legislation. This is why on the morning of the vote, Sunak had a very hurried bacon sandwich and coffee breakfast in number 10, trying to corral all the rebels together and convince them to not shoot down his legislation. Because he knows that if he would have lost this, there probably would have been an immediate leadership challenge or a general election. They're just playing for time at this point. So, why the discontent? Well, Labour's claiming the UK is now set to hand the African nation 400 million after Home Secretary James Cleverly conserved another, confirmed another 50 million is due in 2024. James Cleverly mounted a robust defence in the House, this is the Mail's editorialising, saying the government is determined to stop the votes and that's what voting for this legislation means. The Home Office confirmed 240 million has been paid to Rwanda so far. Brilliant. Another payment of 50 million anticipated by 2025. No asylum seeker has been sent to Rwanda. And the National Audit Office will publish a report next year on the costs of the scheme and estimated spending in future. So we're just going to get more numbers on how all of our money is being spaffed away on something that isn't working. 
almost like it's designed not to work. Isn't that interesting? Um, also, if it does get passed, it'll obviously be enacted with some opposition. You don't look too happy about this. Yeah, well, a couple of things. One, you mentioned it's it's really an exchange program. Yep. So for every person, if ever we fly over there, they send us or one of their refugees or criminals or something. So it won't actually... Which is not what it was sold as. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to look in the fine print. You have to look in the fine print for that. So it's an exchange program. Secondly, as far as I can tell, we don't just send them to Rwanda and that's it. It's rather they're sent to Rwanda to be processed. Their asylum claim to be processed. Now, I believe that Rwanda are likely to decline nearly all of them. That's the point. Okay, all right. But if we just had a home office that worked properly, or was a c completely been cucked inside out, I mean, there'd be no need for any of this whatsoever. But well, we do but, have one. It's the uh, Rwandan home office. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. We pay for a second home office now, and second home office actually does the home office job. Yeah. So if I was in charge or something, I would just scrap the entire Rwanda thing and make a new department here. Why get Rwanda involved? What on earth? What a completely bizarre, because they're brown. absurd thing. So they're allowed to deny applications. So either make have too the, much white guilt. Either make the home office do its job properly, or if that's just impossible, if they're just not fit for purpose, um, make a new department. And uh, you know, staff it with true believers or people that don't hate this country or whatever you want to say. Get them to do it. We don't, we don't need Rwanda involved in this process at any point. It's completely ridiculous. It's not that I don't disagree. It's also, what are you going to do with people that you suddenly put out of a job at the Home Office that are then motivated to work against you at all levels of government and civil society? Like, um, unless you don't really care, like they're yeah, unemployed you know, now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, well, I, I mean, I would personally just propose legislation to turn all of the boats away and deport everyone. And if you don't comply with that in your workplace, then you will face prosecution, not just job loss. Because mm. you actually need to threaten these people with prison if they act against the law. I mean, shock, far right opinion, I suppose, you know. The treason or sedition. Or well, yeah. yeah. But it turns out they've already declared their intent to be seditious mm. because the Home Office issued a report on the Rwanda policy. And get this, right? They published on the same day that it went through its summary of its official legal position on the Rwanda plan. It was a five-page summary. And, it, and this is according to the Mail attempted to knock down the case for tougher measures advocated by MPs, including Suella Braverman. The document warns that blocking the ability of migrants to bring legal action would be a breach of international law and alien to the UK's constitutional tradition of liberty and justice. Right, so the post-war international order that's set up to define refugees as, per that place and time, anyone who was fleeing post-war Germany is now applied to every North African and so we have to abide by that definition, which is totally obsolete. Otherwise, we're evil. That's genuinely their opinion. So they won't enforce the law even if the Rwanda bill gets passed. Even if the strongest bill gets passed and there are no legal penalties for not going against it, the Home Office will just continue to rubber stamp yes on over 3,000 visas a day. But like Carl said this at a university event we did a little while ago. It's not that the Home Office are unwilling to rubber stamp every single visa. At this point, we just think that the ability to stamp visas is probably limited by the size of the physical building of the Home Office. Like if they could fit more desks in there to stamp yes on more visas every single day, they would. They just can't get enough people in the office to stamp yes. They just want to flood the country with unlimited people. Great. So normally the One Nation Tories, who are the sort of front bencher types, the very Tory wet types, the ones that say they'll do something about immigration and don't, you know, Michael Gove, David Cameron, a hundred of them actually backed the Rwanda plan. Chairman Damien Green said, the most important thing at this stage is to support the bill despite our real concerns. Their real concerns were that it wasn't upholding our international obligations. You know, the ECHR and the UN Refugee Convention of 1952 that defines a refugee as anyone unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin. Just don't want to, mate. Too lucrative over here. Can't be asked. You know, keep me in the country. So, of the 29 people that abstained, there were a few different constituencies. I mentioned this yesterday, but this is the new conservatives like Miriam Cates, Tom Hunt, Jonathan Gullis, Danny Kruger, mix of people that are actually trying to do some things, but have little to no power, particularly since Cates has had a gag order placed on her. Uh, Mark Francois and the European Research Group, the Northern Research Group led by Jake Berry, uh, Suella Braverman and, and Liz Truss and that sort of lot. Um, the wets like Tobias Elwood who's just become obsessed with assisted dying as well, because it turns out that there isn't a war on where we can go send a bunch of British boys to die. So we need to get our death quota up, apparently. 
Uh, and also Robert Jenrick. And the reason I mentioned Robert Jenrick is because he was a former immigration minister. And right before this happened, he came out, did an interview with the BBC, with Laura Kunzberg, and he said, a political choice has been made to bring forward a bill which doesn't do the job. So former immigration minister, who resigned over the fact that nothing was getting done about immigration in the Home Office, has turned around and said, yeah, the government knows the Rwanda bill won't do anything. They're just pushing it forward as a dead cat distraction strategy. Because they actually just want migration to go on infinitely because the GDP, because the international commitments. So they're just lying to us. Great. That's fantastic. I did do a bit of digging and wondered, okay, sure, it might just be economic reasons. It might be that they want to do what the Tony Blair speechwriter said and rub the right's nose in diversity and render our arguments out of date. But could there be another perverse incentive to bring over certain ethnic and cultural constituencies that might favor the Conservative Party? And I had a bit of a think, and I thought, well, we had 250,000 Indians last year. Now, as far as I know, they're not at all at war. Why would Rishi Sunak be motivated to bring over 250,000 Indians? Mm. Maybe it's something to do with this policy exchange report he wrote in 2014, a portrait of modern Britain, where he observes that Indians reliably vote 10 percentage points higher than any other ethnic minority or the Conservative Party. Isn't that fascinating? Now, again, I'll read through some of the data, and you're welcome to accuse me of being a conspiracy theorist, if you like. Um, there's a chart on page 7 of the PDF, right? I'm just going to scroll down quick. Here we go. So these are the five largest ethnic minority groups. This was at the time. Indian was the largest, 1,412,000, nearly 413,000. That's only gone up since, particularly in record migration in the last year. So the what well, one thing I find interesting as well, maybe it might just be the, the bias of the authors here, both of whom are from Indian heritage, but Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladesh are separated out as different ethnicities in the Asian diaspora, and then Black African, Black Caribbean. That's just immediately demarking those ethnicities as maybe having slightly different interests, whereas the Black Africans and Black Caribbeans don't. Almost like it's a target immigration strategy to try and raise the populations among those. But but no, no, no. Okay. Um, interesting omissions in the report. Over the past decade, the UK's white population has remained roughly the same size, while the ethnic minority population has almost doubled. BME groups accounted for almost 80% of the UK's population growth. Just three cities, London, Greater Birmingham, and Greater Manchester, account for over 50% of the entire UK's BME population. Of course, that's been growing in the last few years because it's nearly 10 years old now. So, accelerated on Sunak's watch. Um, interesting data on the sources of stresses in the job and housing market here, 10 years ago as well. Almost all minority groups have unemployment rates that are almost double the national average, 6.6%. Black Africans had the highest unemployment rate at 14.8%. Indians the lowest at 8.1%. Oh, those industrious Indians, bring them over quickly. 40% of black residents live in social housing. It's 48% now in London. Whereas 65% of Indians and Pakistanis live in owned accommodation. Now, there's a difference between they live in owned accommodation and they also own accommodation. I think that might help to explain why, especially in Swindon, all the landlords seem to be Indian, as you well know, Callum. Uh, what's the quality of that housing like? Uh, it's a brothel. The, the, the building is a brothel. Well, so, well at least they're, they're, in, they're in employment, I suppose. I mean, it's industrious, right? According to Rishi Zunak. Yeah. Uh. Um, how are you enjoying the excrement? I love the idea that like, my immigration policy is we need more sex workers. <coughs> I'm going to illegally import sex workers from now on. I mean, I know the Ali G meme comparison to the feminist immigration policy was a thing, but I mean, sincerely, that's yeah. actually your position now. Slave sex workers that, that serve the immigrant population. I mean, that was I mean, basically the thing in Leicester, wasn't it? Yeah. There were loads of slave labor. It used to be a joke that they were like, we need slaves, but then they just want slaves. My GDP, remember. It's funny when you do point out that, you know, the vast majority of, it's a targeted type of, Immigration, because it's you know it's uh, people from the subcontinent or Africa or the Caribbean. You know, we're not flooded by Kazakhs. No, <laughs> you know, we're not flooded by like Maoris. Right, it's not. We haven't got a uh, too many Peruvians in Britain. Right, it's yeah. It's it's curious how it's almost always large sections of former colonial demographics that happen to share the same culture and ethnicity of the politician who's currently in power. It's kind of curious that, isn't it? The thing about also to say about GDP is interesting. I, I saw, I can't remember who it was, but someone on Twitter tweeted, you know, I would rather our economy and our whole standard of living be lower 
than just be flooded with foreign people whose values are antithetical to ours. I'd rather be mm. sort of a second world country. I'd rather Britain be as rich as sort of Portugal or something if it meant we could keep our heritage and identity and all that sort of well, thing. Well, look at the Japanese. I'd, imagine putting that to a reference. I completely agree with mm. that. I'd rather be a bit poorer. Right, yeah. I just did an interview with, with Philip Morland. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Paul Morland and Philip Pilkington, and they compared Israel, Japan, and the UK on their productivity, birth rates, and immigration policies. And Israel is the only one that has ethnically and religiously selected low immigration, high birth rates, and high productivity and a decent GDP per capita. So I would like that very much, please. But even if I couldn't pick that, I'd pick Japan, who, yes, have really high debt to GDP ratio, and that's going to be a problem at some point. But for every single American vassal state, it's going to be a problem because the Americans can't pay back their debt. Yes, they've got low birth rates, but their GDP per capita is much higher than us because they're a very productive, culturally and ethnically homogenous and industrious country. And so I'd rather be in Japan than here right now because they seem to be just running it better because they understand that to keep a country, you can't just flood it with foreigners who are only here because they're on the take. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I thought I'd announce that we have a new line of merch. This is our aesthetics collection. So I was thinking that in the face of AI art, debasing the very concept of art, actually we'd do something quite positive. So we commissioned a series of paintings that were actually really beautiful and could be something that we could present outside of politics. So for example, we have this magnificent painting of a ship weathering a storm, which I thought was just really nice. And we have, of course, a glorious sort of surrealist uh, giant white tiger drinking from a lake. But also there are other things that are just kind of interesting, such as the, uh, the chap lost in cyberspace or something that I thought might, in time for Christmas, make a great present to your mum or something like that, a beautiful cat lounging on some clouds. Um, basically, we wanted to do some stuff that wasn't just political, so things that were just nice and beautiful and interesting, because that's also a part of the world we want to curate. So you can go over to shop.mercies.com. Buying the merch is a really great way of supporting us and means that we can live past demonetization. And uh, I'm sure they make great gifts to the folks as well. well. It's just simply true that homogeneity is a strength, not yes. diversity. Well, yeah. diversity is their strength just... if they want to divide and conquer us. Right. Uh, well, well, yeah. Yeah, the hour in there is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Mm. And <laughs> the reason it's our strength for the political elite is because of this chart on, on, on the uh, paper. It's quite interesting. All of the ethnic minorities vote overwhelmingly Labour, but Indian is 10 percentage points higher for Conservatives than most other groups. Indians are four times more likely to vote Conservatives than Black Africans, 24% to 6%. So, put it this way. If they're seeing, since the Windrush generation, you know, the second settlement of the UK, it's basically our Mayflower, right, that we had a massive con uh, Caribbean and African diaspora come over in that time, if the elite are wedded to this high level of immigration, we're just negotiating which ethnicities make up the composition. And there might be some kind of electoral interest of the Conservative Party to say, well, why don't we make that overwhelmingly Indian? Because, oh, they're very industrious, they buy up all the housing stock, they're, they're entrepreneurial, and they just happen to vote for our party, which is now spearheaded by the guy that observed that they vote for the party and who is also Indian. Now, again, could all be a conspiracy theory. It's not like we have any video evidence for it. Oh, dear. Right. So this was uh, when the report came out. Um, Al Jazeera, of all places, did a, an honest report on it. And I think it's just worth a, a quick listen. And if you look beneath the slightly alarmist headlines here, you can see what they're trying to do. Indians, it decides, are hardworking and much more likely to vote Tory or Conservative. Africans, however, it concludes, are much more likely to vote for the Labour Party, but are also much more likely to be unemployed. The report author says the intention wasn't to raise an alarm about mass migration, but to help politicians better understand a changing electorate. We examined socioeconomic status, life experiences, attitudes and aspirations, and what we found is on almost any metric you look at, there are striking differences between communities, and it would be good for politicians and policymakers to appreciate those. And if you appreciate those in what way, Rishi? Yeah, right. Almost yeah. found the entire immigration policy based around importing that specific population. C curious that, isn't it? It's almost like it came straight out of your mouth about 10 years ago. And this is why, as soon as the Rwanda bill has been passed, as soon as they've pledged to stop the boats, as soon as they've pledged to bring that net migration number down, oh, they've reversed the plans to 
raise the minimum salary threshold for bringing family members over and doing chain migration. Isn't that interesting? So they've rolled back plans on increasing the threshold that Britons need to bring foreign family members to live in the UK from £38,700 down to £29,000. Now, if you look at pre-pandemic inflation levels, which Rishi Sunak caused by his money printing for the eat out to help out and um, furlough scheme, as Callum reported on a couple of weeks ago, actually 38 grand was roughly the equivalent to about 29-ish grand anyway, before the pandemic, before Rishi wrecked the economy and conducted mass immigration and mass inflation. So even the 38 grand is not a particularly high-skilled salary compared to the average salary of about 26 or 27 now. So it's barely above your average salary, highly, not exactly high-skilled labor that was being imported. And so James Cleverly still insisting that this is going to reduce the number of net migrants every year down by 300,000. Brilliant. So we still have a net 900,000 coming into the country using scant public services, bringing crime with them to make us the number one place in Europe for committing crimes from people by foreign nations and just destroying the cultural cohesiveness of communities. Isn't that fun? Yeah, I don't know how anyone could still be a a paying member of the Tory party at this point. Yeah, if you try and infiltrate as, them, then that's as, about it. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> this is why I hate Westminster politics so much, because it really is Groundhog Day. Just whenever anything happens, you might as well just be like, nothing will happen, and you will be right every time. Mm. I decided to just look up an inflation calculator for what is 29 grand now. Yep. So before the pandemic, that was 23 grand. So someone so before the pandemic, if you think about a job to pay 23 grand, that's now the minimum threshold to get a visa here to then bring your family. That's barely a graduate salary. But trust me, that's high skilled work visas. <laughs> What's that per hour? Yes. What's that 29 don't... grand an hour for? Because the minimum wage they're raising to about 11 pounds because of inflation. So let me just check real quick. I do, I do feel like what the Tory party have done since they've been in power this last stint, of course, the Blair and Brown years as well. Um, they, by rights, deserve to be punished, to be wiped out electorally. They don't. It's one of the most egregious crimes. It's it's one of the worst crimes that's ever been perpetrated upon this island. I've said that before. Um, it's the the staggering. It's staggering what what they've done and what they're still doing. Staggering to me. It's sort of you can't quite believe your eyes. Again, where I'm sort of old enough. And my memories kicked in in the 80s and remember the 90s clearly, remember sort of the pre 9 11 years. It's unbelievable. It's hard to describe. I said about 9 11, it's hard to describe to people who don't really remember what the world was like before 9 11 how, how different it was. It's the same with immigration, mass immigration. It just wasn't like this. It just was not like this. They've, it's, it's mainly happened, well, since Blair got in in 97, but since the Tories, really, where the very nature of the, the world around you, every high street in the country, um, the, you know, the very demographics completely changed that nobody wanted. In fact, have actively been saying we didn't want since the 60s. Um, well, my high street's been destroyed since lockdown. A bunch of business is gone. Now we've got actual money laundering fronts. I mean, there was a Turkish barbers on my high street that I've seen a drug deal happen late at night out of. There is a brand new neon lit Pakistani vape shop right next to the, the bus stop where all the school kids get off. That's, nobody's going to be shopping in there to justify the rent and the operations costs. So clearly you're turning over cash inside there that is somewhat illicit. There's another one right up the road. There's now a mosque just, just up the road down the hill from the high street. There's a Polish shop as well. It, it feels like multicultural vomit on my doorstep. And I didn't move. Mm. Like we were one of the last safe haven refuges on the borders of Kent. It was nice. It was peaceful. There was no transient population because there was no bloody tube. And now it's even come for there. Both the big parties and, of course, the Lib Dems and the Greens that are more insane, if anything. Um, they can't be allowed to just continue forever. I don't think it can be. Um, this idea that you would try and change them from within, I mean, that would take a generation or whatever, if ever possible. I, they don't deserve to be sort of reformed in that way. I don't, it needs to be swept away in some sense. I, I don't know. Yeah, but the party is comprised of people. I mean, if you, I if, you, if you rooted out the people from the party, it's not the fault of 
The institution itself does not make people mad. It's the fact that the people that are in the institution that are sabotaging it that are mad. If you cleared out the people from in said institution, it's like you said about the, the creation of the new Home Office Department. Okay, you, the only reason it would work is if you staffed it with true believers. It's not just the creation of a new department which makes people comply with it, right? You have to empty the bloody thing, like yeah. 90 to 95 percent. I mean, what did Elon get rid of? 80 percent of Twitter staff. Mm. I mean, the, the actual level of decimation you have to go through with these institutions just to make them not insane yep. is really hard to comprehend. Yeah, and when it's not, it's not something like Twitter, it's something like a political party, it's not as easy. Even you can't have that situation like that Elon did. You it's can't just really, turn up and get rid of 80 not really, Yeah, it's not really possible. Um, I think that maybe in the future, hopefully, there'll be newer parties. Some will be sort of uh, nationalist or, um, you know, at least patriotic in some way. And some will be sort of Islamist party. The can be other end. Some will be sort of ultra green or something, or just overtly socialist or something. Uh, because at some point, surely at some point, the stranglehold of the two big parties, or the three traditional parties, it can't last anymore. And I wonder at what point the, the, the huge Muslim vote that the Labour get, they'll just form their own party. Um, at what point will the sort of middle class globalists uh, abandon the Tories and form their own, something of their own. It is, it's theirs. Well, yeah, they don't need to, right. Yeah. I mean, the spell of neoliberalism is waning, particularly with my generation. I mean, there was an Onward paper recently where they were tearing their hair out over how Zoomers have been polarized into two very anti-democratic camps because the boomers overwhelmingly believe in end-of-history democracy theory. I think it's about 55% wanted governance by experts, 18 to 25, which means that they're the sort of technocratic Green Party level, the climate's going to destroy us all types. And then another sort of composite group of roughly the same size said they either wanted a strong man who can ignore the whims of parliament because they're not doing anything, or military dictatorship. It was actually an option on the ballot. And they said, yeah, we prefer that at this point. And they're obviously when they're thinking that, they're not thinking the woke RAF. They're thinking, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the kind of horse guards that we saw at the Queen's funeral riding down and stopping at Albania Day from draping a flag around Winston Churchill's statue. You know? So the, po the polarization is coming. Right. It's just, yeah. It will take an electoral wipeout of this magnitude. The problem is, as you've alluded to, the option that we're going to get, inevitably, um, same policies, different color on the car. Right? Mm -hmm. Labour Party are indistinguishable. So, yeah, not looking good going into 2024, boys. I wish I had a a bit more hope, but at least you can understand the reasons that we've been sold out by Rishi Sunak and vote accordingly, I suppose. If you enjoyed that segment from Podcast Lotus Eaters, why don't you check out uh, Stelios's latest symposiums? This one is on Miyamoto uh, Masashi, which is, uh, I think he's a samurai dude of some sort. Anyway, check that out and you can follow us on Twitter or you can go to lotuseaters.com and sign up a free account there. You could also, if you want, give us some money, which would be very good.